This is a production of Cornell University. Works, there we go. Um, so I'm really excited to share this project with you all today, um, especially as um, I'm here with plant scientists and horticulturists and experts in greenhouse and high tunnels. Um, as you'll see, uh, why that's important. Um, uh, to use those things to help us educate about climate change. And um, ultimately, we're hoping our goal is to have a positive impact, but we want to do something a little bit different. Um, so I'm the lucky one who gets to speak to you today, but I have two collaborators. Um, actually, I have lots of collaborators on this project, and I'm going to highlight them all at the end, but here's a few of us here at the site. But key to this effort um, has been Chris Ween, who um, has now left the project, unfortunately, but we keep drawing, trying to draw him back in as often as we can. And then Josh Serra from Landscape Architecture, who uh, the three of us um, served as the principal investigators when we started um, putting this project together. And our con Josh and I are continuing to work on this with a host of other folks. So um, before I tell you about the garden itself, I wanted to give you a little background, at least from where we were working from, so you have some context for uh, where we were coming from and what we were trying to do. And as I think most of us are aware, we, um, Climate change is one of the biggest challenges that we're facing. And this is a slide that I pulled from NASA when I was initially preparing this when they were saying that January has broken all records. Um, that has quickly been uh, eclipsed by all the records set in February for being the hottest, uh, let's, let me make sure I say this right, the um, most anomalous warm month ever recorded. So February broke all of January's records. So we know that this is an issue, and there's lots of scientists on campus who are working on this. Um, but what we also know is that as the public, there's um, a disconnect between the knowledge that we have about climate change and our willingness to do something about it. So in talking about, in looking at what other gardens were doing, so plantations as the public garden of Cornell, we wanted to know what was happening out there. And a lot of work uh, has been done on plant conservation efforts specifically in looking at um, how we conserve plants either in in situ or ex situ programs. Um, two of the recent ones that have just been released is uh, the New England Wildflower Society recently put out this habitat-based approach when they profiled their five key habitats for the Northeast region and are discuss the environmental issues that are facing each habitat and um, discussing the impacts of stressors such as climate change are likely to have on those. An international organization called Botanic Gardens Conservation International is looking at um, climate change on plants, the impacts on plants and their ecosystems, or at the cellular level. And this report uh, lists how the impact of climate change will affect animals, will affect hu humans who depend on them but also provide some recommendations for how to stave off extinction or to work toward these um, issues that are being faced. Probably the most predominant way that public gardens are educating about climate change is through phenology studies and looking at things like Project Bud Burst or Project Bud Break. And um, they're doing it in a few ways. One is by using their own plant records, which public gardens are well known to have very detailed and accurate records and a lot of gardens are using these records to record the times of first leaf out and the first bud break. Um, but they're also now looking at installing plants uh, on a what's called a phenological monitoring garden and looking specifically at specific kinds of plants and how they're flowering at different times. And then they're also involved in uh, citizen science efforts which train volunteers, staff, uh, school children to go out and record the date of first bud break or leaf break within their communities. And then the other way that um, we're familiar with were our um, ways in which gardens are interpreting pub uh, climate change and their outreach programs. So in terms of interpretation, the American Public Garden Association is working to develop a set of templates that are based on the most recent climate science about climate change. 
providing information that gardens can develop their own interpretive tools for or there are outreach programs such as the community climate action program at the chicago botanic garden which takes a slightly different approach and goes out into communities and works with groups that are traditionally not represented in the climate change programs and they go into the community they work with these community groups on issues that they're facing that are related or are the result of climate change and look to find assets that this community can use to solve problems and so are really taking it at a community level approach. And then there are educational outreach efforts such as the Fairchild Challenge, which is out of the Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in Miami that is a K through 12 environmental science competition and many of the topics that are addressed in that um, through art and literature, through debates, um, are focused on climate change. So um, in looking and trying to find out if anybody else is doing something called a climate change garden, we came across this effort at Syracuse University and in 2014 they installed what they're calling a climate change garden that will track how plants will adapt to global warming and they planted 33 different species of trees and shrubs, some of which are adapted to central New York and some which are adapted to warmer regions. And they will be monitoring these to see if there are any changes in health and the vitality of these species. So I'll also share that uh, the executive director of the American Public Garden Association saw what we see and feel, and that is that public gardens really are uniquely positioned to be, as he says, the place to learn about and experience climate change, and that public gardens are places where visitors can make local connections to the global issue. And this was something that um, really is something that we were very interested in. That we didn't, we appreciated the phenological studies and the phenological monitoring gardens and the outreach efforts. In fact, we're trying to partner with the Chicago Botanic Garden on that community-based asset approach that I described. But what we were looking for was something that was demonstrative, that was experiential, that was interactive, that was compelling to visitors, that somehow gave them a sense of what climate change um, is expected to do and what impacts it would have locally. And in looking at this, and in going through the project for a couple of years, um, we recently came across a paper from uh, Perspectives on Psychological Science that was written to address how public engage we can improve public engagement in policy efforts toward climate change. And just briefly, I thought I would share some of these because they are in line with some of the things that we're trying to do and some of the goals that we have, which is that um, we value experience over analysis. So a lot of the climate science that's put out there, a lot of what's seen in the media, a lot of the articles that are written or even interpretation we're seeing at public gardens is very analytical. We're putting lots of statistics out, but as individuals, um, we do have an analytical side of our brain, but we also, um, we react to our gut. And so if there was an opportunity to really highlight relevant experiences, how people may be experiencing current effects of climate change or our seeing patterns uh, to build on that. The other one that really jumped out was this out of sight, out of mind. And I think we may have all experienced this in this, that climate change is some future phenomenon. It's not going to happen in our lifetime and it's happening across the world to somebody else other than ourselves. And so how do we make that, how do we change that perception? And one of their recommendations is to emphasize what's happening now and what's happening at a local and regional level. And the last one, which I didn't highlight here, but I think is really important, is this um, idea of how we are motivated to act. And we are either motivated at an ex extrinsic level, you know, there's some carrot they're waiting for us, or from an in intrinsic level. And what their study found is that there is this deeply held motivation that we have intrinsically to want to make the world a better place. So they recommended tapping into that somehow. So we haven't quite figured that one out, but we'll come back to that. So what we decided to do it was come up with what we are calling a crea creative experiment. And it's not a true experiment in the way that we're all used to thinking about control and experimental. But really we wanted to figure out if we could create a garden or some kind of experience within a garden that would inform visitors about climate change, would physically demonstrate what we might expect um, in some future, not too distant future. 
that would use plants as a lens to communicate what these impacts are likely to, um, to look like and that gave visitors some way to really experience this or, and even to interact with um, these changes that we are seeing. So we have um, came up with a way to do this and our approach was to um, look at it with from an environmental control standpoint, a plant response standpoint, a visitor response standpoint. So the environmental controls, this is where Chris Sween came in and his love of high tunnels. He said, you guys at plantations need a high tunnel. And so that's kind of where we started. Um, but really he was, he was advocating not just for us to have a high tunnel, but that he felt that it could be a tool to approximate some of the predicted future climate conditions. And then as horticulturists and as gardeners and at a public garden, we really wanted to have plants as the lens and wanted to see if we could find plants that would show effects of temperature and precipitation and could be good communicators of what we were expecting to see. And then ultimately we're doing this so that we can have some impact on the visitors that come through. And you know, at, on a spectrum of what we want to do from goals, it's one, increasing their knowledge of and concern of, but for me it's always about some intent to act, some making that world a better place. And I think my colleagues would agree with that. So enter the high tunnel and we received uh, an initial grant from the Towards Sustainability Foundation to buy a high tunnel and install it. And so this is, uh, was installed, it's a 24 by 20 and 12 feet high, high tunnel um, covered with um, a polyethylene uh, film. And while there are lots of other devices, some far more expensive that can approximate more accurately the effects of climate change, we were drawn to the high tunnel because it's relatively inexpensive and we can regulate temperature uh, because of the radiation and the ventilation and that uh, we could also control irrigation. So in addition to constructing the high tunnel, we also constructed 12 raised beds, four by six beds, both outside the garden, outside the high tunnel and inside the high tunnel. And we installed uh, temperature sensors both inside and outside the tunnel. It, this, we are using an onset computer model U30 Hobo to take both the air temperature as well as soil temperature and measuring the active radiation during the growing season. And then what we set out to do was to create what we're, we called the garden of today um, in the outside beds. So they would experience the temperatures and the precipitation and the temperature the, the climate changes of today. And then we wanted to approximate some future climate and we selected the garden of 2050 and we did this for several reasons. One is when we in, um, invited Jonathan Schult who is a professor of communication to um, work with us on this project, he was saying, you know, you really need to put a date on it otherwise it's that future, distant future, it's never going to happen date and that date of 2050 really gives us something not too distant that we can um, understand. 34 years is not that far away. Hopefully many of us will still be alive then. Our chill, we can imagine our children in this climate. So um, that was one reason. The other reason is that we are using the NYSERDA climate report and within this report which is um, full of lots of good information but um, in particular there are climate models and they're based on the 2020s, the 2050s, the 2080s and the 2100s. So we, the, this time frame gave us um, a clear model to work from. And this is the report that I just mentioned and this is an assessment that provides information on climate change impacts specific for New York State and even more specifically for various regions. And we are here in, let's turn that on as you can see, in region three and there are climate projections for temperature, precipitation, sea level rise, heat waves, cold events, intense precipitation, extreme events, and storms. So we were using this um, report to uh, get at those projections. So what are they? Um, starting with temperature, that for the 2050s we are expected to see an average annual increase of between 4.4 and 6.3 degrees. 
There are expected to be an increase in days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, um, up to 38 days. And we're going to have a greater frequency and duration of heat waves, so three to six consecutive days over 90 degrees or more. And we're expected to have five or um, three to six of those heat wave durations lasting five or more days. And then our annual precipitation is expected to increase by four to ten percent. Now this increase right now is looking at winter. That increase will happen primarily over the winter and that actually in this late summer and the fall there will be a decrease in that precipitation. Um, and we're also expected to have some increase in frequency and intensity and duration of extreme precipitation events. So looking at all those projections, um, we started, we installed the garden in 2014 and this is the garden itself, just to give you a sense of where it's at. It's located in the Botanic Garden Bowl of Plantations. It's in what's known as the Pounder Garden and it sits within the southeast corner of that garden. And um, we spent the first year primarily installing the high tunnel as I showed you and getting the beds in and um, figuring, we did minimal interpretation. We were having lots of discussions about how we would interpret it. and um, but. In talking about the plants, we were very ambitious in this first year and we selected six different categories of plants to display and walk you through those. Uh, this first one it, that's pictured here is uh, a temperate species that would have an earlier and abbreviated growth period in the high tunnel. Uh, the second bed was landscape plants that would grow well in the high tunnel but not be hardy outside. So as a southern girl, I was really excited to see this Lacrostromia in there. Didn't last very long. Um, and then uh, having more temperate species that would have an earlier and abbreviated growth period. Unusual species of tropical origin that would grow well outside in, but not um, in the high tunnel. Um, no, it would grow well in the high tunnel but not so well outside. And these were things like okra, peanuts, cotton, malabar spinach. And then we did uh, varieties of peppers, uh, several different varieties. And then tender perennials things that would grow well um, in the tunnel but not so well outside the tunnel. And this was an interesting, watching how um, people interacted with these plants was very interesting. In this, this garden, uh, this particular bed, um, a couple of anecdotes both for myself and for the student who was working in there is that when people saw this they were like, climate change, bring it on, I can grow this here now. They were really excited. So this when we're talking about plants as messengers a little bit later, we always come back to this one about being, being clear about what kind of message we're um, trying to convey. And then this is the interpretation we had for the first year, which was very simply um, a welcome sign, mentioned a little bit about the garden and what we were trying to do there. We did have a brochure with a detachable survey and invited folks to walk around and inter our idea is that they would interact with the garden and tell us a little bit about what they felt about the quality of the plants inside and outside, so the flip of this had um, an inside the tunnel and asked them to rank and then had these directed questions. And we put out 100 surveys. They were all gone at the end of the season, but we only received nine of these uh, detachable surveys back. Um, and from that, we saw that these open-ended questions didn't work so well. People did tend to fill in the, the quality, but not so much on the, on the open-ended questions. And then we had staff or our, we've had several interns work in the garden and they documented their observations uh, both about the garden but also about the visitors that were there and the kinds of questions and interactions that they had. So there were a couple of lessons that we learned from this first year uh, that we've take, we took on to for this last year in 2015. And so as I mentioned, it was we really were getting started planting the garden, seeing how well it would work. Um, what we did is that in the high tunnel we were able to get, um, even though it was not severely restricted in terms of the ventilation, uh, we were able to get an increase in the temperature higher inside the tunnel than outside the tunnel. And we also observed differences in plant growth inside and outside. And um, I just mentioned to you about the visitor survey results or lack thereof that we got. And, um, but also, Probably one of the most striking things was how people used the site or didn't use the site. And I'll, I'll try to. So this is where that sign was, that uh, the interpretive sign. 
and with the brochure. But in order to get into the garden, you either had to go up this step, walk around this planting of corn, and bypass the high tunnel, which everybody wants to walk into at first, or you had to enter from some other part of the garden or jump up off this you know, probably two feet um, retaining wall. So it, we weren't really able to direct the experience and how people moved through it. And there wasn't a lot of signage that said, this was the garden of today, this was the garden of 2050. So enter what we did last year, which was to um, improve the visitor experience and go into that first. So this is a fairly accurate rendition of that was done by Marie Jacques Barr, who is a student in landscape architecture, to really help us redesign the experience so that visitors understood what they were coming into and what they were seeing. And with the exception of this arch, which isn't in the garden, we did install some new steps so people could come directly into the garden. And then we displayed a sequence of interpretive messages um, along with what we call focused information tags in the garden. And just to give you a sense of what that looked like, um, here at this first space, and this is what it looked like as you walked up to it, uh, we tell you a little bit about the garden itself, a little bit more about some of the science behind it, what we're hoping to do in the garden, very clearly say this is the garden of today and this is the garden of 2050, and give you some of those graphics that um, another student in landscape architecture helped us develop to convey some of this information, which if you read it in a paragraph, it's pretty hefty, um, but she worked really hard with us to graphically depict that so it was more visible, especially when you look at some of the interpretation, which um, studies that say most people spend maybe two minutes if we're lucky looking at a sign. So then um, before they enter the garden, we wanted to stop them and tell them a little bit about the plants that they would be seeing in these gardens. And when I mentioned we were very ambitious about the plants that we had in the first year's garden, um, what we one of the things that our students saw in her observations is that it was very um, daunting. There were lots of plants to look at and the messages and doing a comparison between six different categories and what ended up being 36 different plants was um, pretty overwhelming. So we narrowed it down to two categories of plants, nectar resource plants and vegetables and grains, and then we tell them a little bit about why we're interested in looking at these plants. And then we tell them a little bit about um, that there are these, what we call, we call them focused information tags, we're trying to call out something or draw their attention to something or get them to interact. And then when they get to the back of the garden, before they enter into the garden of the future, we wanted to give them a chance to record some of their observations. So this is one of those. And then before they enter into the high tunnel, we tell them about what they're about to enter into. So again, we're using some of those graphics that were developed to say, what does the garden of 2050 look like? What are you expected to encounter? And then we have this um, chalkboard where we can call attention to what is happening within the garden. And so at this particular time, we were initiating a heat wave, um, trying, to, trying to initiate a heat wave. We, um, are, we're, we tried to be six, uh, follow the projections and had six heat waves uh, over the course of the 2015 season. And then finally, as they exit, exit the garden, we wanted to give them some uh, another opportunity to share their observations, so things like this. And then give them a little, uh, give them some way to learn about more about the garden. And then we gave them a takeaway brochure, which um, is based in large part on the work that David Wolf did in his chapter about gardening sustainably in a changing climate. And he was very generous with this work to um, give our visitors something that they could leave with that gave them some tools to do more. Um, so the other thing that we tried to do in addition to improving the visitor experience was really to tune the tunnel. And in this case, we um, didn't get quite the increase that we were looking for in 2014 that was consistent with the projections for 2050. Um, so we really wanted to figure out how we could tune that tunnel to get the temperature increase, the average annual temperature increase of 4.4 .4 to 6.3. Uh, we also installed, in 2014, we were manually rolling up the sides of that high tunnel to restrict the ventilation to get the temperatures up. 
And last year we installed, um, so you see there's the manual. Um, and when you have to do it a couple of times a day, it's not hard, but it gets, gets to be a lot of work. So we um, installed some, we automated them. And I'll talk a little bit about that automation in a, in a few minutes. And then we really wanted to mm. figure out and test uh, and identify plants that could be our messengers and whether they were susceptible to the impacts that we were seeing with climate change or if they were showing resilience um, to them and looking at um, how they would be affected by temperature and eventually precipitation, um, whether it, they had accelerated growth or senescence, bloom time differences, stress-related di uh, stress diseases. And could we interpret those uh, in a way that our visitors would understand and that we could attribute to a temperature or precipitation in, uh, change in precipitation or temperature? So um, as I mentioned, we focused on grain crops. And we want, what we wanted to do was tie the, um, this idea of the food, food is going to, our food plants are going to be affected by climate change. Um, and in some cases, we know how, but in some cases, we don't know how. So we thought we would start with grains, since so much of our diet is based on grains. And then we would have other plants that are common in home, gardeners, home gardens. So in these beds here, we have uh, barley, wheat, and oats. And what we, we know about, at least with wheat, is a, it's a short-lived annual. And under increased temperatures, it could grow faster and have reduced yields. And so that's something that we could interpret um, in this case, last year, we had uh, some disease that affected the, the wheat. And we don't know, again, why this was the case. But this is something, this is something that we're trying to tune in terms of um, understanding it. We also tried beans uh, in the garden, both inside and outside. And as I mentioned, that we went through s six heat waves. And when these beans were setting their flowers, we had one of those heat waves. And so what we ended up seeing was a split set of the beans, which you see we have beans of different sizes because at higher temperatures, the beans will drop their flowers, which for a home gardener may not be a big deal. But from a production standpoint, could have a real impact in having seed, uh, fruit of different sizes. And both the grains and the beans were done relatively early in the season, so it gave us an opportunity to try out um, another set of crops. So we tried out lettuce. And um, we had different germination rates inside and outside of the garden. So we're recording those. And this is a different set of uh, varieties of lettuce that were planted in the bean beds. And then for the other final food crop, we had uh, peppers and wanted to see what kinds of differences we could expect there. And then the other set of plants were our nectar resource plants. And we did this by early blooming flowers, uh, late blooming summer flowers, and then fall blooming flowers. So this is the early summer flowering plants, things like Iris versicolor, the Monora, the Pentium. And uh, wanted to see what kind of impact that they would have. And this was another way that. Um, Instead of just pointing out things, we were asking for visitors to comment on their observations. And with the exception of the first set of checks in both of these, which is us putting it on there so people know what to do, um, you can see that our visitors generally recognize the difference between um, what they were seeing inside and outside. And then these are the late summer flowering plants, so two different varieties of Asclepias and a Picanthemum. And again, trying to draw attention to what we were seeing um, and help our visitors see that. So here we're asking them to count the flowers um, inside and outside, see if they can notice a difference. And then finally, we had the fall blooming plants. So we had Solidago, Cleone, and a common wood aster. And um, in this case, excuse me, we um, had this poor Cleone that was being over um, competed by the Solidago. And we simply say here, uh, this Cleone is having a hard time competing. Plant communities in the future may change as some plants better adapt to new conditions. So the other thing that we did last year was to, uh, inst to work with Jonathan Schult from communication to um, really get serious about a visitor survey. We saw limitations of our initial one. And we wanted his help. And his work is working with public perception of climate change. And he's a statistician. And so lots of good things to offer. And 
what we did with this uh, visitor survey is that we asked some general questions about knowledge, people's knowledge, their concern, their opinion about climate change and how it's caused, when the changes will occur, and the likelihood that they would take some action. And all of these questions are based on um, previous uh, on polling data, whether it's Gallup poll or ABC News polling, um, yeah, New York Times polling. And this is so that we can, we can use our results and we can compare them to what's being polled uh, on a national level. We also then asked some very specific questions to our project, things um, about what impact we would have on local plant communities, uh, those nectar resource plants, the local crops, what um, people could expect in 2050. Do, are they recognizing the changes that we're likely to see? Uh, what, is it, what is gonna happen specifically in central New York? Wanted to understand if they, had, if they felt like they had access to reliable information and uh, then if they were seeing any differences between the plants inside and outside and whether the signs that we had up uh, were of help. And so our initial results, um, just saying that this was a pilot test. We um, didn't launch it till the very end of the season. We only had 43 precip participants and most of those were students from communication. Uh, so they, were, they had incentive to participate. We also um, had tour takers folks who came on tours of plantations who were willing to do it. And with that, with only having 43 participants, we don't have, as John says, not enough statistical power to um, say anything, but he was, and these are his words, initial indications are that there's something detectable happening. <laughs> so um, he, he was very encouraged by what he was seeing, but he wouldn't say anything more than that for this. <laughs> but he's on board for, for us to do this next season. So talking about that and what we plan to do, uh, we are, again, working on refining what we're doing. We're not really changing the plant material uh, very much. We want to refine that garden experience in looking at um, the interpretation and how people navigate through the garden. And um, we want to see if we can uh, fine tune the, the tunnel and whether we can eventually replicate this. So in terms of the garden um, and the tunnel. One of the things that Josh was successful in doing was um, partnering with um, a professor from the Department of Biological and Environmental Engineering, Pete Marchetto, who is working with us to build, as best I can call it, a widget um, that will take the temperature from that computer sensor, the weather station, and monitor what's happening outside, um, know what we want to have happen inside in terms of average annual increase, but also these heat waves. And it will take all that information and it will do what we want. And he's told us that we can even have a heat wave button on this so that the, side, the sides of the tunnel and the vents and the doors can be automated to ventilate the, the tunnel to have the kind of controls that we're looking for to meet the, the projections that we're hoping to replicate. The other thing um, we're trying to do is once we get that temperature dialed in is to figure out how we can um, start to include precipitation. So right now we've only been working under one, the one variable of temperature and seeing if we can raise the temperature in the high tunnel enough to meet what's being projected and to see what kind of impacts that will have on plants. But we know that precipitation is gonna be a big um, issue for plants. And so we're talking about how we might do that with soil sen uh, moisture sensors, but also with hand watering and um, drip irrigation, and things of that nature. And we really want to get the plants right. Um, we are trying to, as I said, use plants as messengers. And we want to make sure that the plants that we're using will have some effect and that that effect is the result of either temperature or precipitation. And that they are have the ability to be observed and that we can interpret that observation. So this is something that we're continuing to work on and certainly if you have suggestions or um, comments about how some, which plants might do well, um, our team's already been talking with folks like Thomas Bjorkman and looking at broccoli perhaps because of its, um, the effect that temperature can have on it. And then, um, we're also really wanting to look at how uh, we can have that impact on visitors. And if, we, if we're having an impact, um, what is it and why, to what extent, 
And if we're not having an impact, why not? And what can we do to change that? Um, so we are, as I mentioned, really aiming for a more robust sampling of our visitor survey, of the visitor surveys. But what we'd also like to do is to do some visitor observations of how people are in the garden, what kinds of questions they have, are they making observations. Um, if we're able to do some interviews with visitors, we'd like to get that qualitative data as well as the visitor data, survey data. Um, and ultimately, what we'd like to do is to figure out if this is a project that we can replicate, that other gardens or other organizations can um, do their gardens relatively inexpensively and have the same kind of impact for their region and use this as a tool to help visitors understand about climate change. Um, and so I just want to um, share some words of thanks. I mentioned Josh and Chris at the beginning, but there's a host of other folks who are working on this project with us. So folks like Donna Levy, who's going to be managing the garden for us this season, Sarah Fiorello, who really has been instrumental in helping us with the interpretation for this program, the gentleman there on the bottom your left is Jonathan Schultz from Communication, and then Nina Basic and David Wolf have also been um, agreed to work with us and collaborate with us on the project to really help us understand some of these things that we're still looking to figure out, things about plants, what effect the we're having on plants and, and what's the reason for that effect and some of these irrigation issues. So we had a great meeting last week and are very excited to have them working with us on this. And then there are a host of folks at Cornell Plantations um, who, you know, without whom we wouldn't have this program, either they are out there installing this garden, helping us find plants, sourcing the material. And then we've had a host of really phenomenal graduate students, people like Emily Rodeker and Julie Romula Aldez, who I don't have a picture of, who was the, the young woman who did all those graphics that I was showing you, and then uh, Mike Roberts, who is also an employee at Plantations, but he's now working on a master's in looking at climate change. So this is not a one-woman show, except for today. And then um, I just want to uh, recognize the support that we've gotten financially from the Towards Sustainability Foundation, the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future for Com Cornell Plantations, and the Department of Landscape Architecture who've um, made this possible. So with that, I will end and be happy to take any suggestions or questions or comments that you might have. Yes, uh, yeah, I, you know, actually, but Crucially, looking at the plants, it looks like plants did better in the tunnel than they did outside the tunnel. I think that's a really, the choice of plants is really going to be critical. And I, one of the things like you mentioned that jumped out at me is iris versicolor is a obligate wetland plant. You might want to take that out. It's, a, it's not going to be, it's, it's a wetland plant. And so you're in a, a situation where you probably won't do better in either, in either situation. Yeah. Right. So just to think. I mean, thinking about those plants that really are going to show what you want, because just looking at it, it says, hey, they did better in the tunnel. Right. And this is, the, <laughs> this is some of the, the visitor observation that we had. And um, I mean, I, I picked those photos to show the plants. Um, there are other photos that show the, the opposite of that. But if you're going through the garden on that particular day, that's yeah. what it looks like. And that's what it says. And we have that effect where with the um, all of those tropical plants, we're like, oh, well, this is cool. Bring it on, right? right. So yeah, how, how are you dealing with rain inside the high tunnel? So we um, have a water gauge um, outside measures rainfall, and what we've been doing is, met, is watering the same amount inside the tunnel. So we have a gauge on the hose that um, waters, so that we're at this point keeping the soil moisture equivalent in both outside and inside. So you're watering the soil, but not. It sounds like you might not be watering the foliage. Well, that been, could be a big part it of is a big part, and right? And this just recently came up that when you're hand watering, you're you, you're cooling the plants, right? By and if you're got it on the foliage, and how are we doing that? So what we were discussing last week is if we can get through irrigation in there, that would be all the better, and we might even be able to control it and make sure that they're if they're equivalent. If we want to keep them equivalent, we can do that. But if we want to say, okay, it's a heat wave and it's a drought, then we can withhold water. Uh, Sonia, similarly, in terms of the plant material selection, you've selected plants for inside the high tunnel that have uh, warmer range in general. 
Might you also have a set of plants that are typically found in more cooler ranges, um, you know, to, to show them being heat stress in that future scenario? Right, so the, the plants that um, we had in the 2014 season had that. We had some that would show stress under um, cooler temperatures that would make it through the winter, but then they would also have plants that were um, more temperate here, more uh, adapted to this climate. But in the second season, we, we didn't go to that extreme in terms of having all those different kinds of plants. Um, but it's, it's a constant conversation that we're having about how to evolve, especially with the plant material, and are we not only telling the story of how things are going to be adversely affected, but are, might we also be telling the story about resilience and how we're, we're going to have to adapt to this at some level. And so maybe we can bring in some of these plants that are being bred for warmer temperatures and how might our farmers or agriculturists use them here or even home gardener. Don? I know that um, a goal of the garden, both in terms of the plantings and the interpretive signage, is to increase awareness among the visiting public of the reality and seriousness of climate change. Typically, an even higher goal is to move visitors to action. So is any of the future interpretation going to address actual actions that people can take? Well, yes, that, that's the ideal. And the only thing that we have right now that's doing that is the brochure, which provides um, information, as I mentioned, from David's chapter that gives gardeners a tool, either how to adapt their garden or things that they can do to mitigate using their garden for climate change. Um, you know, some of our future, you know, blue sky discussions have been um, having another high tunnel and showing how you might adapt things you might, or things you might mitigate in your garden and what impact that has. So, and, you had mentioned that you know there's some hope that this serves as a model that can be used in other gardens, and I'm curious if you have heard of uh, have other gardens contacted you about this program, um, or have you had an opportunity to present this model, or are you waiting to fine tune it before doing that? Um, very good question, and no, we don't we don't really want to wait. I mean, part there's part of that is we want to make sure it's good, but we also want that feedback in terms of what other gardens are likely to do. Is this something that, that would res um, work well for them? Do they have the space? Do they have the funds? Even at relatively inexpensive, a high tunnel is still $10,000, and plus all the other plant material and beds. Um, but we were, so at the American Public Garden Association, they're aware that we're doing this, and to, they're serving as a clearinghouse for others who are interested, and so through them, I've been contacted quite a bit by other gardeners and in fact was invited to speak at um, last summer's Botanic Gardens Conservation International about this project and was asked to be a part of climate about how gardens can um, educate about climate change. And then um, I will be presenting at this summer's um, APGA seminar. The, the, there's t and then we were invited to participate in two grant programs about climate change education and that this would be a model that we would be sharing um, and talking with other gardens about. So keep our fingers crossed on those. And there also will be an article that Sonia has authored about the climate change garden in the next issue of Public Garden Magazine. Along with Josh. Yes. Um, I'm just curious what the state was with uh, the, the widget that's monitoring and doing all that. I was in Pete's class last semester, okay. and which we, it was sort of a loose collective of students working on that project. Yeah, okay. But I know Pete has uh, left and taken a new job, so right. I was just curious. But <laughs> right, right. Well, thank you, because um, uh, the reports that we were getting, even though I don't quite understand, that's why I called it a widget, because yeah. I heard about it. I was like, I'm not really sure how it works, but it sounds very exciting. Um, and Pete and Josh really understand it. Um, so Pete, although he's left to go to another position, he's still in town, and we're actually meeting on site um, later this month for us to figure out how to install it. So along, it's it's electrical powered, but we'll have a solar panel that will power it so we can walk the walk with what we're trying to do as well. Um, and so hopefully it'll be installed by the end of April and then we'll be using it for the season. Yeah, come down and see it. You can help us interpret it. <laughs> Get your name afterwards. Well, I want to thank Sonia for a fascinating seminar. And I think we all need to make the track down the hill to see the climate change garden this growing season. Thank I you. I hope you will. Thank you. And thank you.
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.